In the past episodes, we've seen that a lot of phenomena can be understood by invoking some kind of interplay between the dimensions of space, time, and mass. These three dimensions are fundamental to any mechanical understanding of the world, and we won't really question their status until the very end of this series. The playing field they offer is quite exciting as it is. To organize our exploration, we've been concentrating on cases where the data accessible to experiments are purely kinematic, grouping space and time together. For instance, we track the trajectory of a falling apple, or an orbiting planet, or a pinching droplet, or a nuclear blast. In these examples and more alike, we only measure sizes, durations, and combinations of these variables. And yet, we call on an extra dimension, that of mass, to make sense of what we are seeing. We invoke mechanical quantities, or mass-carrying quantities, combining the kinematic dimensions of space and time with the dimension of mass. The kind of quantity we get depends on the proportions of time and space, that is, on the values of the space and time exponents, x and y. Energy, force, pressure, viscosity, density, etc. These quantities can be driving or resisting motion, depending on context, as we've seen in episode 6. These mechanical quantities provide the reasons behind motion, the dynamics underneath the kinematics. The foundation of the relationship between mechanics and kinematics is the connection between pairs of mechanical quantities and kinematic power laws. Omitting for a moment the special case where the quantities are on the same column, we can say that for each pair of mechanical quantities, there exists a single power law where size is proportional to time raised to some power alpha. The prefactor k and the exponent alpha are derived from the underlying mechanical quantities q1 and q2. The scaling relating time and space is a direct consequence of the relative dimensions of the mechanical quantities x1 minus x2 and y1 minus y2. This relationship between kinematic variables and mechanical constants is expressed quite synthetically when the variables are some type of length, d, and some type of time, t. This perspective on kinematics is particularly simple and intuitive because it aligns with our choice of fundamental dimensions. d is a length and t is a time. This canonical perspective on kinematics certainly has a privileged position but largely because it satisfies our subjective preferences, or bias toward a clear but somewhat dated separation between space and time. So in the last episode, we insisted on the fact that describing kinematics as a relationship between length and time is just one out of many possible viewpoints, or perspectives. For instance, in some contexts, we saw that plotting a speed versus a time could provide new insights on the dynamics. A speed versus a length was particularly useful in the context of velocity profiles in fluid dynamics. And graphing a frequency omega versus a wave number k is quite fashionable in the study of waves. These different perspectives provide complementary approaches on the same physics. The physics are set by the quantities q1 and q2, and the perspectives by the choice of kinematic variables. The exact form of the scalings differ from one perspective to another but they are always the direct consequence of dimensional analysis. They can be rederived with a few lines of algebra. All these formulas have the same structure. A first kinematic variable kappa 1 is expressed as some power law of a second kinematic variable kappa 2, and the prefactor is given by the ratio of mechanical quantities. Once the dimensions of the mechanical factors are known, and once the dimensions of the kinematic variables are chosen, the exponents alpha and beta can be obtained without difficulty. The perspective is a matter of choice. However, in this eighth episode on mechanics, we will see that for a given pair of mechanical parameters, there is a perspective depending on a single variable, kappa, in direct relation to the mechanical ratio. This spatial kinematic variable provides what we can call the right angle on the dynamics. How to construct this perspective and what is gained from it is what we will try to find out. We'll start with an example, one we've encountered before and that had a tremendous influence on mechanics, the free fall. In this context, an object, like an apple, falls down to the ground. 
Before any significant friction can set in, Galileo had discovered that the trajectory is characterized by a constant acceleration. This fact is now taught in pretty much all schools throughout the world, so it is easy to overlook that a constant acceleration must have sounded like a complete oxymoron back then. What did Galileo mean? Initially, the trajectory of a falling object follows a parabola. The distance traveled since the object was dropped increases like the square of the elapsed time. So in log scale, the data points follow a slope of 2. Here, the scaling is only partially written, that is why we use this wavy symbol. We use this symbol when the left-hand side and the right-hand side have different dimensions. It is said that the two sides are not dimensionally homogeneous. To resolve this issue, we can introduce a kinematic prefactor, k, which must be a constant, that is independent of the variable distance d and of the variable time t. By construction, this kinematic constant has dimension l t minus 2, so it is an acceleration, a constant acceleration. The freefall is a kind of motion at constant acceleration. So if we represent this motion from the perspective of a distance covered over an elapsed time, we get a parabola in linear scale. But if we use a different perspective on this same event, the shape of the curve will change accordingly. For instance, instead of plotting the distance over time, we can plot the average speed over time. Now the speed grows linearly with the elapsed time. We could also represent the instantaneous speed, which also grows linearly with a difference by a factor of 2. We've seen these kinds of shifts in the last episode already, and they are not the focus here. The average speed will suffice. Now, we've seen this motion from the perspective of a speed versus time, and nothing prevents us from going a bit further and plot the average acceleration over time. And indeed, this acceleration is roughly constant during the freefall, around 4.9 meter per second square. The instantaneous acceleration is twice bigger, around 9.8 meter per second square, which is the standard gravitational acceleration g characterized by Galileo. Let's sum up our path from one perspective to another, and let's do this summary in log scale, starting with a freefall represented as a distance over time. From this angle, the kinematics appear as a straight line of slope 2. If we now represent the speed of the falling object over time, we still get a straight line, but with a smaller slope, a slope of 1, which is to say that the speed grows linearly with time. Now, if we represent the acceleration over time, we see that it is actually independent of time. It is a constant, a spatial kind of straight line, the horizontal. The right-hand side of the equation, k, is a constant by construction, but the left-hand side, a, is a constant built out of compensating variables. For instance, if the acceleration a is the average acceleration, then it is the ratio between the travel distance d and the square of the elapsed time t. Both d and t are variables, and varying indeed. Nevertheless, when they are combined in this way, the variations cancel each other out, and the result is constant. This perspective on the freefall is quite special. When we represent a speed over time, or a distance over time, the relationship between the horizontal and vertical axis is diagonal. The straight line represents the correlation between the axis of the graph here the distance and the time. One is varying with the other, and vice versa. Knowing how long it takes for the falling object to reach a distance d is the same as knowing which distance is covered after a given elapsed time t. With such kind of diagonal parallel, changing the variables on the vertical or horizontal axis necessarily changes the slope of the line. In contrast, if one of the variables is the acceleration, here on the vertical axis, then changing the other variable on the horizontal axis does not change the slope of the line. It remains horizontal. For instance, this plot demonstrates the constancy of the acceleration at different distance d from the beginning of the fall. And here is the acceleration versus the average speed of the falling object. Still a horizontal line. So in the context of the free fall, all perspectives that include acceleration as one of its variables are essentially similar. 
acceleration versus time, acceleration versus distance, acceleration versus velocity, acceleration versus anything you want. All these perspectives lead to a horizontal line. The choice of variable kappa 2 on the horizontal axis is irrelevant. In a free fall, acceleration is constant, invariant, and quite indifferent to any orthogonal dimension we may choose. On a plot like this, with a horizontal line dividing the kinematic plane, the vertical and horizontal axis have fundamentally different structures. We've just seen that the horizontal axis is quite unrestrained. It can have any dimensions we want beyond those of acceleration, and any sort of units, centimeters, minutes, meters per second, anything we may come up with. In stark contrast, the vertical axis has to be an acceleration. The dimensions of the vertical axis must be L t minus 2, or powers of this spatiotemporal combination to be a bit more precise. As for the unit of this axis, we are still at liberty to choose the units we want, here using the metric units, or here the imperial units. An acceleration of 4.9 meter per second square is the same as an acceleration around 16 feet per second square. In both cases, metric or imperial, the acceleration is expressed by combining units of space and time. But we can also directly use a unit of acceleration, a g, that is one unit of gravitational acceleration. In this case, the average acceleration, a, is just one half of g. This one half comes from the fact that one usually considers the instantaneous acceleration rather than the average acceleration, such that the kinematic constant k is one half of g. So using k equals half of g as our unit of average acceleration, we naturally get a horizontal line of ordinate 1, here in linear scale. Given the equation between the acceleration a and the kinematic constant k, this horizontal is not surprising. We've just moved the right-hand side to the left-hand side, and so the ratio of a and k is naturally unity. All these considerations may sound trivial or unnecessarily abstract if we solely consider this one example of the free fall. However, the remarks we've made in this particular case can be generalized to any sort of regime. We've just seen the famous example of constant acceleration, but they are constant variables of all kinds. If we're okay to say constant acceleration, we should welcome this apparent contradiction as well. For any pair of mechanical quantities, for any regime, there is always a way to combine the initial variables to define a new variable, which will remain constant in the range of validity of this regime. Take one of our favorite examples, the Trinity explosion. We've seen that Taylor showed how the blast dynamics could be understood as a struggle between the energy output of the bomb, E, and the resisting influence of the ambient air of density rho. This 2 over 5 scaling between space and time is the direct consequence of the relative dimensions of the energy and density, the pair of mechanical parameters. From this canonical perspective, the size d of the blast is given as a function of the time t since detonation. However, we can adopt different perspectives. For instance, tracking the speed of the front at different distances. We've done that in the last episode. No need to repeat this. Instead, let's go directly to the point, finding a combination of variables that will end up being constant. Easy. Put both variables on the same side. The right-hand side is constant since the energy and density are constant parameters. So the left-hand side must also be constant, but rather fortuitously. Constant despite being constructed from variables. If size is proportional to time to the power 2 over 5, then plotting size divided by time to the power 2 over 5 naturally yields a constant. We've tilted our perspective on the explosion in such a way that the regime is now flat. Explosions do not have a constant size, nor happen for a constant duration. Their front does not have a constant speed nor acceleration. They are not characterized by a constant diffusivity, but by a more exotic combination of time and space. What is the name of this kinematic combination on the left? It has dimensions of length over time to the power 2 over 5. It does not actually have a standard name. 
In fact, only a fraction of the possible kinematic quantities have been named in the past centuries. A tacit rule that has been used to curb neologism is to only define kinematic quantities with the smallest possible integer exponents, to avoid fractional exponents like 2 over 5 here. So in the context of this regime, one would typically take the fifth power on both sides. Now, the dimensions of the terms on either side involve integer powers of space and time. At this point in our investigation, this preference for integers can only appear to be arbitrary. It will take us much more time before we can precisely understand the roots of this bias toward natural numbers. And actually, even in this form, the quantity has no standard name. In the series on explosion, we took the liberty of calling it the explosivity. If the dynamics of the blast radius of an explosion are due to the opposing effects of energy and density, then the explosivity is constant by definition. And this is roughly the case for the Trinity explosion shown here. The value of the explosivity remains practically the same from a fraction of a millisecond to a fraction of a second after detonation. By defining the explosivity, we've been focusing on the vertical axis, redefining it in such a way as to produce our so-called constant variable. Throughout this process, we've not touched the horizontal axis, time. Just like we changed the original y-axis, we can also change the x-axis. For instance, instead of representing the explosivity over time, we can plot it versus the size of the blast d, or versus the speed of the front. Note that here, the explosion is actually proceeding from right to left, since the speed is decreasing over time. Same remark if we plot the explosivity versus the acceleration of the leading edge. Just as in the case of the free fall before, what we choose for the x-axis of this plot does not matter. Not only is the explosivity constant over time, but it is also constant for all sizes, for all front speed, and for all front accelerations. For the x-axis, we could actually choose any kinematic quantity as long as it is not a power of the explosivity, which would just replicate the y-axis. The horizontal axis is largely arbitrary. The dimensions of the selected variables are inconsequentials, as are its units. In contrast, for the vertical axis, the mechanics underlying this motion are suggesting a particular unit for the explosivity. The ratio of energy and density is an explosivity. Both sides have the same dimensions. So we can use the ratio of energy and density as our unit of explosivity. If we put everything on the same side, we just get a number, unity. So the regime combining energy and density, seen from the perspective of an explosivity, intrinsically provides a unit of such explosivity, the ratio of energy and density. If we divide the constant variable on the vertical axis by this explosivity, that is, if we use the ratio of energy and density as its unit, then the regime is just a horizontal line of ordinate 1. Whereas the horizontal axis still has units, arbitrary units, subjective units, the vertical axis is given in objective units, a unit of explosivity given directly by the mechanics at play. When written in this way, the energy density regime of explosion has been made dimensionless. The quantities on the left-hand side have been combined in such a way that the resulting dimensions are independent of space, time, and mass. All exponents sum to zero. The left-hand side, just as the right-hand side, is a pure number, a number with no units, what has come to be called a dimensionless number. In their simplest expression, dimensionless numbers provide the right angle on each particular regime. Nevertheless, the term dimensionless number is also used to describe more complex combinations of kinematic and mechanical quantities, with no overall dimensions of space, time, or mass. We'll come to these other kinds of dimensionless numbers later in the series. For now, we'll focus on simple dimensionless numbers. Given an arbitrary regime, expressed here in the canonical perspective of a length versus a time, we know that we can always put all variables on the same side, 
then raise everything to the power x1 minus x2 so as to avoid fractional powers of the mechanical quantities q1 and q2. Since the right hand side is just a ratio of constant mechanical parameters, then the left hand side must also be constant. Now we can take the extra step of using the ratio of q1 and q2 as unit for the constant variable on the left hand side. Another way to say this is that we can put everything on the same side to obtain a dimensionless equation. And that's it. We've built the dimensionless number of this regime. Well, the devil, as always, is in the details. We said that this is the dimensionless number of the regime, but any power of this number would also be adequate. There are not just one, but an infinity of equivalent dimensionless numbers with the same underlying structure. When the right-hand side is exactly 1, then 1 raised to the power gamma, whatever its value, would remain 1. But if the value of the right-hand side is not exactly 1, choosing different values of the free power gamma will lead to slight differences, which can become quite tricky when dealing with actual examples, rather than this general but abstract formula. Why would the value on the right be different from 1? Well, because the variables chosen to represent the regime may not be the canonical length and time we have here. We've seen, for instance, that using an average speed or an instantaneous speed yields some differences. These differences pile up and end up shifting this neat picture a little bit. Take this example, the dynamics of a laminar boundary layer, which we first encountered in episode 6. In this case, the size d of the shear layer of fluid near a boundary is growing over time t. More precisely, the thickness of the boundary layer is growing as a square root of time, according to the balance between the viscosity eta of the fluid and its density rho. The greater the viscosity, the faster the expansion of the boundary layer. This scaling is a direct consequence of dimensional analysis. What is not given by dimensional analysis is the value of the numerical perfector, which we can call delta. The value of delta depends on the more precise details on the configurations of the boundary layer. In the case of a flat plate and a uniform flow far away from that plate, which is the case relevant to the data here, the value of delta is around 5, a result first derived by Blasius. How we got to this result is not of our concern today. We just need to know that this prefactor is not exactly 1. And indeed, the line drawn here includes this prefactor delta around 5. Now let's apply the general procedure we just outlined to this particular example to go from a regime, written from the canonical perspective of a length versus a time, to a dimensionless number. But this time let's use a straight equality and keep track of the numerical perfector delta. Here, the impelling factor is a viscosity, and the impeding factor is density. We can then put variables and parameters on the same side. The left-hand side is then a dimensionless number. It is a pure number, just like the prefactor delta on the right. But in contrast to delta, we can see that this number is built from factors that do have dimensions of length, time, and mass. But these dimensions cancel each other out. This combination is the dimensionless number associated with the boundary layer scaling. Or we should rather say that it is one of the possible dimensionless numbers of this scaling because we know that taking an arbitrary power, gamma, is always allowed. We say that dimensionless numbers are defined modulo an overall power. For instance, in this context, as in many others, one usually takes a power gamma such as to remove the fractional exponents. In this case, the smallest exponent gamma that does the job is 2. Then this group of parameters and variables on the left is one possible dimensionless number we can use to describe this regime. It combines the mechanical parameters rho and eta and the kinematic variables d and t. In the context of fluid dynamics though, this dimensionless number is usually written in a slightly different form, using a speed and a size for the variables. Let's get into the nitty gritty once and for all and assume that the speed is the instantaneous speed, which will complicate matters a bit. So V is the speed of the leading edge of the boundary layer as it is extending away from the plate. Besides, we know that the size of the boundary layer follows a parallel of time, 
while the prefactor k encompasses the ratio of mechanical factors. Then differentiation leads to the fact that the instantaneous speed is half of the average speed, that is half of the ratio of d and t. We can then use this equation to replace the time variable by the speed variable. We then obtain a slightly different form of the dimensionless number associated with the pair of density and viscosity. We can put the numerical factor of 2 on the other side if we like. And written in this form, the dimensionless number on the left is known as the Reynolds number, or just the Reynolds, after the British physicist Osborne Reynolds, who came up with it in his study of turbulence in fluids. For a boundary layer, the value of the Reynolds number associated with the thickness d and speed v is a constant equals to half of delta square, so around 12. Let's see this step by step. Here are the boundary layer's dynamics, as seen from the perspective of a distance growing over time. The extra data points correspond to different values of uniform speeds far away from the plate. As we saw in episode 6, in this regime, the kinematics are independent of the precise value of the speed. Now, let's keep time for the horizontal axis, but let's plot d divided by the square root of time on the vertical. From this perspective, the regime looks like a horizontal line. The constant variable we've put together is independent of time, and actually independent of any variables we may choose. What kind of kinematic quantity is it? We succumb to the general dislike for fractional exponents, and so we take the square. Now, our constant variable has the dimensions of a length squared divided by a time, so it can be understood as an area over time. And fortunately for us, such kinematic quantity does have a name. It is called a diffusivity. The boundary layer is diffusing away from the plate. The dynamics of the boundary layer correspond to a constant diffusivity, given by the ratio of viscosity and density, which is sometimes called the kinematic viscosity, and written as nu. Now we can put the mechanical constants with the variables to obtain a dimensionless ordinate. This dimensionless number is a sort of Reynolds number, but not exactly in its traditional form, so we can use the speed instead of the time. Naturally, the horizontal line does not correspond to 1, but to half of the square of delta, so around 12. This number is quite different from 1, yet, when precision is not required, we'll tend to say that this number remains of order 1, and the precise value is omitted when we use the approximate equality. Using the usual definition of the Reynolds number, with the instantaneous speed, has already divided the constant by 2, and it is not too hard to imagine alternate definitions of the variables that would get the constant even closer to 1. As the series progresses, we will be able to more precisely understand what is meant by order 1, but we will first have to clarify the notion of order of magnitude, which will be done in a few episodes. In the meantime, there are still some important things that we can say about dimensionless numbers, so let's do that now. The boundary layer and the Reynolds number correspond to the pair formed by density and viscosity. One pair, one dimensionless number. And there are a lot of possible pairs from this table, even if we restrict ourselves to the standard quantities that are named here. So there are a lot of dimensionless numbers out there. Only a fraction have been named. We'll discuss a few. Let's keep the density, but pair it with a stress. Since episode 4, we know that this pair produces a constant speed, the speed of sound. Here is the regime in the canonical perspective of a travel distance d over time t. Putting everything on the same side, we get a dimensionless number. In this case, the constant variable is the speed, which we can use in the definition of the dimensionless number. Basically, the dimensionless number gives the ratio between the constant variable v and the speed of sound built from the stress sigma and the density rho. It is called the Mach number, and it is of order 1 for sound waves. Now let's consider stiffness and viscosity. This pair also leads to a constant speed, the viscocapillary speed, that is the ratio of stiffness or surface tension gamma and viscosity eta. Putting everything on the same side and using a speed variable v, we get the standard dimensionless number dealing with the interplay of viscosity and surface tension. This one is not named after anybody, and is simply called the capillary number. Now, the number combining surface tension and density is the Weber number, here written from a speed and a size, 
as usually done in hydrodynamics. For the pair of surface tension and force density, we know from episode 2 that we get a simple length, the capillary length, and the dimensionless number associated with it is often called the bond number. For force density and density, there is a fruit number. The standard definition of this number is an exception of the tacit rule of avoiding fractional exponents. In some parts of the literature, the square of this expression is used instead. The procedure to obtain dimensionless numbers also works for simple times, as in the pair of stress and viscosity, associated with the Weissenberg number, also called the Debord number, when written in terms of time variable. Again, there are a lot of pairs, and so there are a lot of dimensionless numbers. As we just saw, some of these numbers have been named after figures who had some part in defining them, and they are often referred to using the first two letters of their name. This is true for the Reynolds number, the Mach, the Bonn, the Weber, it is almost true for the Weissenberg number, which uses W and I, so as not to be confused with the Weber number. And some numbers, like the capillary number, imitate the style of one capitalized letter followed by a lowercase letter, although no surname is attached to it. This odd nomenclature can become quite impractical when dealing with an increasing number of regimes, and can be the source of bitter priority disputes. So in this series, we will adopt a more neutral and less reverent notation. Starting with a canonical perspective on a regime, we'll put the variables on the same side, raised to the power x1 minus x2 to avoid fractional exponents, and move the mechanical ratio to the left. This is giving a standard way to define the dimensionless number associated with the pair q1, q2. We will just refer to it as n q1, q2. As usual, the order of the indices, q1, q2, does not matter. So if we neglect numerical factors of order 1, most dimensionless numbers defined with this procedure coincide with the traditional definitions, and the other cases are identical, modulo an accidental power, vestige of historical circumstances. There are much longer lists of dimensionless numbers out there in books or online. For the mechanical dimensionless numbers, which only involve the dimensions of mass, size, and time in their factors, we invite you to check how they are connected to the pairs from the table of mechanical quantities. Any pair of mechanical quantities is associated with a dimensionless number. This is worth repeating. When a pair is seen from an arbitrary perspective, it will usually appear as a diagonal in the kinematic plane. The dimensionless numbers of this regime kills two birds with one stone. First, it identifies the constant variable. Let's call it kappa. Kappa is the right combination of compensating variables. And if we use it as one axis of a new perspective, we get a horizontal, or a vertical, depending on whether we put kappa in abscissa or ordinate. This perspective quite literally gives the right angle on the dynamics. The regime becomes orthogonal. If one of the axes is the constant variable of the regime, then the other axis can be anything other than kappa, and it will not change the slope of the line, the shape of the plot. The other variable is irrelevant, just like time was irrelevant when considering simple length in episode 2, or how space was irrelevant when considering simple times in episode 3. That's one thing that we gained, finding the right angle. The second thing that the dimensionless number of a regime achieves is finding what we will call the objective unit for the constant variable kappa. The constant value of kappa is simply set by the ratio of the mechanical parameters q1 over q2, the impelling and impeding factors. The dimensionless number is the constant variable kappa given in these units. Oh, we were fine throwing around the constant acceleration taught to us by Galileo, but now that we're pushing his logic beyond the free fall, we're losing ground. The dimensionless number of a regime is the constant variable given in objective units. All of this feels quite arcane, and it's time to address the elephant in the room. What is really the difference between numbers and units? We've been using these terms casually since the beginning of this series, but we're starting to see that the boundary between these two concepts is not as clear-cut as one might think. In a sense, 
figuring out the connection between these two concepts, numbers and units, is the general goal of this whole channel. So we won't solve this conundrum here and now, but we must say a few things to clear the air. Let's come back to an example we've seen before, the viscocapillary regime, which is to say the regime implied by pairing viscosity eta and surface tension gamma, which leads to a simple speed, so size d is proportional to time t. In this particular instance, the size is that of the liquid bridge and the time is the duration before pinch-off, so it is running from right to left. This pinching configuration is just one out of many possible setups exhibiting the viscosity surface tension regime. Let's zoom out to accommodate additional datasets. As we just saw, the data here correspond to the pinching one gets for the liquid bridge between two plates. Similar viscocapillary dynamics can also occur with rising bubble pinching off. In that case, the viscosity is that of the outer fluid. This regime has also been found in a number of slightly different configurations of droplet coalescence. For these examples, the neck between the drop grows and the time is running from left to right. We'll give a lot more details on this in the droplet series, and we've reviewed this topic before. You can find a link to the review and to the original studies in the video description. As we will see shortly, the differences in setup actually have a marginal impact. The viscocapillary regime is observed during pinching, during coalescence, and also during spreading of drops onto substrates. Here, the size d is the radius of contact. All these lines have the same slope, but the intercepts are different because the values of viscosity and surface tension are different, giving rise to viscocapillary speeds ranging from over 10 m per second for water with a bit of glycerol in dark green to slightly over 1 micron per second for collate polymer mixtures in faint green. What we are seeing here is how all these experiments look like from the perspective of a length versus a time, the canonical perspective. But we are free to use a different perspective, and in particular to adopt the right angle. In this case, the constant variable is the speed. We kept the time as the other variable, but we could have chosen the size or anything we want other than the speed and we would have kept the same horizontal lines. Here, regardless of the fluid and setup, we've measured all speeds in meters per second. Of course, we could have used any arbitrary unit we want, like centimeters per minute or feet per hour. In any case, the choice of unit is completely subjective. We can, if we want, measure the speed of these pinching, coalescing, and spreading droplets in relation to the length of our feet, and to a fraction of the rotation period of our planet. This is what we're doing when measuring speed in these subjective units. We are allowed to do this, but we should recognize how presumptuous we are to expect that the dynamics of droplets would be best described by such provincial choices. When, for instance, we say that the pinching glycerol happens at a speed around 54 feet per hour, the number we get, 54, is due to two different things. First, and hopefully, it is related to some actual natural phenomena, which was recorded sometime at the turn of the millennium. Second, the number 54 is connected to the choice of unit. If we choose different units, we get a different number. So these two concepts, of units and numbers, are obviously related. This is not really contentious. 54, or 27.6, these numbers are a bit random, as random as our choice of units. Can we instead find a way to define more objective units, less bound to our preferences, units that would be set by the mechanics at play? Yes, we can. This unit of speed is given by the ratio of surface tension and viscosity. For each experiment, like the pinching glycerol, we know the surface tension and we know the viscosity, so we can compute their ratio and use it directly as our unit. This unit is more objective than any of our choices because it is given directly from the mechanical quantities dictating the dynamics. In contrast to subjective units, like meters per second, the value of the objective unit changes from one experiment to another. Here it is around 6 cm per second, but it must be computed in each case separately. Once we have our objective units, we can then plot all curves together. The curves now start to overlap, revealing their inherent similarity. 
With these objective units, all speeds are reasonably close to 1, but not exactly. We know why. From the right angle, the scaling is simply given by the relationship between the speed v and the ratio of surface tension and viscosity. However, we know that there can be numerical factors of order 1, which depend on the details of the experiment. The vertical position of the lines corresponding to each experiment is given by the value of delta in that experiment. Plotting the speed v in units of gamma over eta is the same as plotting the dimensionless number of the regime, which in this case is the capillary number. This is the first thing we need to remember about the relationship between numbers and units. The quantity kappa given in units of kappa note is the same as the dimensionless number kappa over kappa note. This elementary fact is always true, and in particular for the viscocapillary regime, expressed as the constant speed in units of gamma over eta, or as a capillary number. If a dataset exhibits a plateau, this means that the speed is constant. If this plateau happens at a value close to 1, this means that the mechanical pair we've chosen to rationalize the dynamics is valid. However, the match is rarely perfect, and the average value of the dimensionless number gives the constant delta, depending on the specifics of the experiment. If these specifics are not in focus, one can very well include delta in the definition of the dimensionless number, so all curves finally overlap, at least with this logarithmic scale. In the linear scale, we can see some systematic departures, like here or here. These departures are the signature of the growing influence of mechanical quantities beyond surface tension and viscosity, and we'll come to them in the next episode. We here talked about the case of the viscocapillary regime, but the procedure to overlap different experiments by defining the appropriate dimensionless number is completely general. We do this for Taylor's regime in the third episode of the Explosion series, and we will have the opportunity to apply the procedure to other regimes in future episodes. We've started this whole series by constructing this table of standard mechanical quantities. We've seen since that the elementary building block of a dynamical understanding of motion is a pair of mechanical quantities, one driving the dynamics, the impelling factor, and the other impeding it. In the last episode, we saw that the interplay between the impaling and impeding factors could be expressed from multiple perspectives, depending on the choice of kinematic variables. Today, we saw that in the remarkable case where the perspective aligns with the mechanical pair, one variable is enough to describe the dynamics, what we provocatively call the constant variable. In contrast to all the other kinematic combinations, this constant variable and powers of it come with an objective unit, given directly by the mechanical ratio. Building on this spatial case, can we find ways to define objective units for any variable we may choose? Yes, but we'll need to take an important step first. We've spent 8 episodes discussing pairs of mechanical quantities, and we are now ready to tackle dynamics emerging from considering a third quantity. The addition of this new mechanical parameter will allow us to more sharply understand the concept of units, subjective and objective. And this will be the subject of the next episode.